Good evening and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan. And as you know now, because we are in our 31st year, I talk to writers about their work, what they're working on today, what they've accomplished in the past, what they might be planning for the future. It's a wider net than writers, however, we have had on other brands of artists. We have had on sculptors, painters, musicians, actors, all, all kinds of creative people. So if you have a guest idea for someone who might fit on the writer's block, please watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of 1623 Studios is a result of cable access television, a valuable, wonderful community asset. You don't get it with DISH, so you stick with cable and the writer's block. I'm very happy to say tonight we do have a writer by the name of Sandra Williams. And by way of introduction, I'm going to read a couple of sentences from the bio that is included in her recent book, Moss on Stone, about which we'll talk in a minute. Sandra Williams has taught language arts, world literature, and reading, writing, and research for over 25 years in both high school and university levels. Having always written poetry and essays, she has now authored Moss on Stone, a book we're going to be talking about, and also Time and Tide, a collection of tales. She lives on Cape Ann with her husband, artist, Robert. Sandra, welcome to the Writer's Block. Thank you, John. Thanks for inviting me. Now, I mentioned the title of the book, and I'm going to hold it up right away, and we're going to put a digital image in, in a in post, as they say, Moss on Stone is a wonderful book. Can you tell me where you got the idea for this book about Susanna Norwood Torrey? Yes, I will. Well, when my husband and I were ready to retire, we knew we wanted to come to Cape Ann and we were walking down the Mount Pleasant Street and we walked past the inn at Cove Hill, which is a B&B &B, or was a B&B. And on the gate, there was a sign that said the house was built by Caleb Norwood, uh, found, uh, built with gold, found at Gully Point somewhere on Cape Ann. And of course, we were both fascinated by that. So when we did move, I went to the Sandy Bay Historical and Gloucester Libraries and wanted to see if it was really true. And I never determined if it was, but it looks like the family did find gold and build many houses in town. Uh, and at the time when I was at the historical, um, I found the diary and then I read it. And that's when I got the idea to expand on what she brought and um, write something around it, which I did. So uh, Susanna was from a long line of Norwoods on Cape Ann and yes. later married uh, Solomon Torrey. And uh, she wrote a diary for I think about two years? Yeah. Uh, about a year and a half it was. A year and a half. Now tell, tell us about your discovery of the diary and reading the diary. Well, I, I was reading a, a book by Peter Burkholz um, <clears throat> and uh, he mentioned the diary in it. So that's, I think I looked for it after he mentioned it. It was at the library. Uh, one of her descendants, Susanna's descendants had written, had published it for a thesis for the University of Salem, I think it was. So I read it and um, it was just so fascinating to me because she was, she was very young, maybe 21 when she wrote that. And she was so thoughtful and the writing was beautiful. Maybe not the grammar all the time, but the writing was, was wonderful and lyrical. And she had so many interests. I just wanted to bring her to life again and on Cape Ann and have people you know, learn about her and her family as well. I should mention her dates here, 1826 to 1908. Yes, she so, lived a long life. So 80, is that 82 years, I think? Uh, yeah, I think that that's about yeah. right. 80, 82 years, uh, or is it 84? I can't do my math, <laughs> but I'm on camera. Me either, I'm an English major. <laughs> <laughs> so you were captivated by the diary of this, again, very young woman and decided to write a novella 
based on her diary with your own imagination of her life and thoughts. Tell us when you started and how that process went and how long it went. I think it took me about a year to write it. Uh, it was published actually in 2017. So it's been almost three years, but I did a lot of readings on Cape Ann and tried to uh, man uh, market it, but I wasn't really interested. I didn't look for an agent for it. I self published it. It was just a project that I had that I wanted to complete. So it took me about a year. Uh, I did a lot of research and I wanted to write in the style uh, from her point of view in an afterlife reviewing her life yeah. so that's how i um, had a way in and i think it worked pretty well and i wrote in her style as well i tried to <laughs> i i love the discovery when you read this when you read your book you discover very early on the first page i was susanna norwood tory past imperfect tense so she does not exist She's talking from the spirit world. Yes, yes, she is. And um, that gave me a way to uh, review what she experienced and also to comment on it, trying to stay in line with her, what she would have thought or what would have happened. And sometimes I didn't use everything in the diary. So sometimes I just paraphrased that or put it in a way that would uh, reveal what she was trying to convey, I think. Tell me, what was more difficult, imagining uh, another person's thought or imagining the period that person was in that was so different. This is <laughs> decades before the Civil War, she's writing. So it's very, very different than America. In yes. 2020. Well, I felt that I was right there with her and as her and in the, in the period, of course, I was living in Rockport, so that helped. Um, I still feel very connected. In fact, um, we moved a couple of years ago from where we were when we first came. And from my kitchen window, I can see her house where she lived, where she wrote the diary. And I imagine sometimes, oh, there she is in the garden with her grandmother, you know? So I still feel very connected. And I did at first, and that's why I wrote it. Not connected necessarily to her, you know, karmically or anything, but just, uh, just as a young woman. And she had quite a life, even though it was a quiet, narrow life. She was interested in many, many things, world things, global happenings. Um, her husband went to the gold rush in 1849. Yes. Um, she wow. wrote about uh, Irish um, freedom fighters, uh, other people in the world. She wrote about the abolishment of slavery in France Republic. So she, she was well informed. We're living in a small town. Yes, we're living in a small town. She was not a... Uh... Uh, a recluse by any means, not a uh, uh, Emily Dickinson kind of person. No, no, she, she wasn't. Did. She traveled a little bit. I know she she went to, went to Boston at least. Yes. Well, her husband's family lived in Quincy, and uh, they had a a quarry in Rockport and in Quincy. So she uh, she did travel there. I think mostly you know to visit his family. I don't think she went anywhere else that she that she mentioned anyway. And there's really nothing written about her anywhere else that I could find of any consequence for what she did in her life after that, after the diary. Tell us a little a, a little bit about her whirlwind romance with Solomon Cole. <laughs> I know that the painter who did the portrait that's on the cover of your book, Moss on Stone, was infatuated with her, but she was not interested in him. She was interested in Solomon Tory. Yes, and it's kind of an ironic thing. Yes. Uh, actually, it's Alfred Wiggin, who was the artist, and his work is in Cape Ann Museum, some of it. So he painted her portrait, and he wanted he asked her if he could paint her portrait. And I suppose she was friends with him and another couple, and they did some things together. And then one day, Alfred brought Solomon, a friend of his, to meet Susanna, and that was it. <laughs> he, uh, he never had any you know, chance after that, because I think they immediately connected. And he even, she says he even tried to, you know, break them apart, but he, he wasn't successful, she said. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he regretted that introduction <laughs> yeah. of his friend to uh, Susanna. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the, the gold rush. Fill us in on that, please. 
Well, I guess that was the craze, right, for everyone. Um, and so her husband was not satisfied with working for his father, although his father funded his journey out there. And I think they, he left with uh, eight or nine other people from Cape Ann to travel around Cape Horn to go up through California and the Yukon. Yes, they sailed. They, they yes, they sailed. So she didn't know if she would ever see him again. I mean, it was a very dangerous journey. Yeah. Um, he did write to her. So there are some letters that were available too, back and forth, which I include some portions of in the book. Um, he didn't come back, I don't think, with much of anything. It does, I don't know that he did or didn't. Um, they did end up building their house, their dream house, and it was quite elaborate, I think, for that time. It still is, and it's very oh, unique. And what did they call the dream house? Uh, they called it the Stone Cottage, but it's actually a sprawling, almost like a sprawling mansion uh, on Norwood Avenue. And we'll, show, we'll show a graphic of that. I, I was I was hard pressed to see any stone in that picture of the house. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and it's right. It was right on the har. I guess the harbor was right there at that time. Now it's a little bit of distance away. But um, she often talked about going there and working in the gardens and planting things. It was her hus her father's or her family's property. They owned everything from Pigeon Cove. I mean, from Goose Cove to Pigeon Cove, the headlands, that was all Norwood property at, at, at that time. So they did have some in, uh, means to build I, houses to... Uh, I think you mentioned in the book that uh, she was the result of her great, 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 great grandfather landing here on Cape Ann. Yes, Francis Norwood came in 15, 1657 from Gloucester, England. And um, he settled first in Saugus and then in Goose Cove. And I guess when settlers came, they, they received some property that they had to develop. Mm -hmm. And that house is still there. You can see it going over that bridge uh, near Goose, over Goose Cove. Uh, if, you, if you're going toward Anasquam and look to the left, you'll see a big old house and that was his house. So it's still there. <laughs> I wonder if you could read a couple passages from your book. Moss on Stone. Yes, and I'd love to. May, may a passage, if you would, from her diary that shows the young woman's uh, spirit and attitude, and a passage from your imagination, your creative uh, life. Okay, fine. I'd love to. Um, well, maybe I'll, yeah, this is my, my writing, and then there's a quote from her right at the end, a very very soon. So now uh, I do say that, um, mention that she is in the afterlife reflecting back. Now from this distance of space and time, those earthly illusions that do not exist here, I linger preparing to return to life anew. What did I leave behind? A portrait for others to look upon, a scrapbook of moss designs, a diary, and a stone cottage by the sea. Oh, and then- um, this, that, That's your writing. That's my writing. But yes. Through it all, in her voice, through it all were the immutable gifts of nature to renew my soul with unequal joy, asking nothing in return. And then this is from her, this quote. Between this thicket and the wood lay the sought for, the sought for valley covered with rocks piled one about the other, a spot of ground large enough to set my foot for near an acre, not large enough to set my foot. And these rocks were covered with the most beautiful mosses I ever saw. And she collected mosses, both sea moss and moss on stone, and uh, worked them into designs and baskets and uh, other things that I guess was maybe a common thing for women to do or for people to do then. She also had a botanical book uh, album that she kept. And I saw that at the library as well. I think I have a picture of it on the back of the book here, a little picture from that diary. I mean, from the uh, album. And then um, I'll read just something else too, maybe about Kay Ban. If I can find something quickly here. As she writes something about her, she loved salt. 
I guess I should say, as I read the diary, I noticed there were certain themes throughout. And so I divided the chapters into those themes, like solitude, memories, home and hearth, um, that kind of thing. And this one is about Cape Ann and her love of nature and Cape Ann. A most beautiful walk by the seashore of my old ocean home. I cannot but love it, not only for being my native place, but for its variety of wild and majestic scenery, the ocean extending further than the eye can reach, with a few islands scattered here and there along its rocky coast, its hills and well-cultivated valleys, its big woods, and almost endless variety of natural curiosities. Um, so she, and she speaks so much about nature and her need and her wish and her um, strategy to get away very often to go out into the woods, the meadows, the shore yes, to look for moss. I was struck by that. She, she would be a horticulturalist today, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I think she was maybe a little unusual for, and I think the woman, the descendant who wrote that, who published the diary and wrote about her, did it comparing different women's diaries at that time. And she said that, you, that Susanna's was unique because she didn't talk about self-improvement so much or religion. She never mentions religion, um, but she did write about worldly things and about her own life. And she was quite, I guess, independent. Maybe that's what was a little different about her. And, and strong, you have her portrayed as a very strong woman and resilient woman because she and uh, Solomon had a son, William, whom they lost very early as an infant, really. Yes, yes, that was very sad. And even though, you know, you have to see if you're writing a book, I think, what is the, what's at stake or what is the drama that's involved? And we all have drama in our lives. I, I, I know we all have stories. So hers, part of hers was that she lost, they lost their son um, uh, almost a, to the day of his birthday, his first birthday. And she does talk about that several different times, going to another child's funeral and how she could barely contain herself yeah. and not throw herself on, on the, you know, the grave site where she was visiting. It was her, I think it was her cousin's um, son who died. So yeah, it's, and so I expanded on that a little bit too because you can just imagine or maybe not how terrible that would be to lose a child. I'm always impressed by stories from our past, uh, the 19th century and earlier about how frequent uh, childhood death was and uh, by, by problems or because of problems that might have been easily cured today. Well, I, I was recently looking at some sessions of a poetry festival, the Dodge Poetry Festival that occurs every year. I have never been to it, but I tuned in and I saw a couple of poets reading and one of the poets said that the, um, the role of a poet, and I think of a writer too, at least from time to time, is to rescue the dead from oblivion. And I just, that just hit me because I was thinking about Susanna and that's what I guess I kind of tried to do with her, to rescue her so that other people could, um, you know, to know her, to see what her life was like and to appreciate a person from another time that isn't so different from us in many ways. Where is her burial site, her uh, and her husband's burial site? She's at the Union uh, Cemetery, which I visited. I couldn't figure out which plot was hers because everything was faded, but it's uh, right across from Front Beach. That's where the cemetery, I think there are two cemeteries there, but they're contiguous. And that's where she is and her family. There's a Norwood plot there. But the, the stone itself is stripped and the stone is too uh, washed out to be legible? I couldn't tell which one was hers. I probably could have uh, maybe gotten a, um, a diagram or something. I did get a diagram of it, but I couldn't tell from that what where she was. And I don't know that her son was buried there. I didn't see that. And I didn't see her husband's either, but you know they may be there as well. It was sort of uh, set off from the rest of the cemetery and there were other plots of families like that. So we're very, we're very close to our time already. It's a big <laughs> show. I want to ask you if you can give me just a minute of advice for young writers who might have ideas to do a book, either historical or fictional or 
a hybrid as yours was? Yes. Well, you know, I'm not an international bestseller, so I don't know that I have advice so much for publication. Um, I think if I were younger, I would have looked and I, if I had time after raising a family and working two jobs, you know, I didn't write a lot while I was teaching other than for my work. But I would say, if you want to write and you can write, write and just keep writing and then you'll, you'll figure out what to do with it if you want to publish it or if you just need to get it down on paper because it's important to, mm -hmm. to um, I think, just to think through and sort out what you know and what you, what you don't know that you know yet. <laughs> well, another brief question. What's your next uh, project? Do you have another book in mind? Well, I, I don't have another book in mind. I did write Time and Tide, which I just revised and reformatted a little bit. But what I want to do and I plan to do is write a, pl a little play based on Susanna's life. And I'm, I would love to get it somehow you know, performed on Cape Ann, but so I'm thinking about it, trying to make some connections. And I'm not sure how it would work because um, as I said, it's not a lot of drama and I wouldn't want a one woman show, but maybe vignettes of different things that happen in her life. I, I'm, I'm gonna work on that this winter. Well, that'd be exciting. I look forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope I, I uh, figure out a way to do it. <laughs> Well, Sandra Williams, I want to thank you very much for being on the Writer's Block. I think uh, Susanna Norwood Torrey has been revived and resuscitated and resurrected by you. And it's a, it's a wonderful book, wonderful, readable, smooth book. And I think inspiring, too. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate your having me. Thank you. I want to thank everybody in our TV world all our viewers for being with us on the writer's block. If you've learned something about Susanna Torrey from Sandra Williams and are inspired to get and read her book, then the writer's block has done its job. So thank you for being with us. And I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night. Yeah.